Welcome everyone. Uh, the Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today celebrating Women's History Month. We celebrate the life and legacy of Fulbrighter and dance scholar Selma Jean Cohen during the 75th year of the program and her post-centennial year. In 2000, the Fulbright Association created the Selma Jean Cohen Fund for International Scholarship on Dance, which honors the pioneering and seminal contributions of preeminent dance historian Selma Jean Cohen. The fund was made possible with a generous gift from Selma Jean Cohen to recognize the importance of her Fulbright exchange experience in Russia and to perpetuate her interests in dance as an international enterprise. All Cohen lectures are presented at the Fulbright Association annual conference in the fall. Focused on international issues, the Fulbright Forum features extraordinary speakers from around the world. Our speaker today, Elizabeth Zimmer, who caught the dance bug at Bennington College in 1960s, began writing professionally in Canada in the 1970s, and has contributed to radio, magazines, and newspapers in New York and California from 1979 till present. She edited Body Against Body, the dance and other collaborations of Bill T. Jones and Arnie Zane, and envisioning dance for film and video, and worked for The Village Voice as a writer and editor from 1982 until its demise in 2018. She has taught dance writing workshops across the USA since 1993 and in the MFA program at Hollins University from 2011 until 2019. The research for her paper on Selma Jean Cohen was supported by a grant from the Jerome Robbins Dance Division of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. She currently acts in medical schools as a standardized patient, studies Feldenkrais method, and writes about dance related subjects for Chelsea Community News. Her most recent project during the pandemic is a coloring book in collaboration with Julie Limberger entitled Modern Women 21st Century Dance. We'd like to warmly welcome Elizabeth to present her research today. Hello. Selma Jean Cohen was born in Chicago on September 18th, 1920. For half a century, she pioneered serious dance scholarship in this country, leaving a trail of monuments. Her books, her stewardship of the International Encyclopedia of Dance, and the 66 issues of her magazine, Dance Perspectives, are legendary. I spent six months reading her papers in the dance division of the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. I got used to the weirdness of whipsawing back and forth across five decades, reading her correspondence, following her constant struggles between art and commerce, and the pleading, placating, and backstabbing among co-conspirators on her projects. She was simultaneously scholar, critic, teacher, entrepreneur, mother hen, and spade worker for college dance history programs, adjudicator, thesis advisor, fixer, and goad. She died in 1965. Selma Jean saved everything. She knew from her teens that she wanted to be a historian, a perception that shaped her filing habits. She also, luckily, had a, the resources, including real estate and a succession of secretaries, to keep track of all the paper. She had apartments in Greenwich Village from the late 1950s until her death. She kept multiple copies of many documents and filed them in different places. Trained as a researcher at the University of Chicago, in 1961, she run, won a fellowship to work in the then embryonic dance collection in the care of curity, curator Genevieve Oswald. She knew what she was doing and who she was doing it for, and periodically she dropped documents off at the Library for the Performing Arts. The Selma Jean Cohn papers include handwritten letters she received from the 1940s onward and carbon copies of her own letters typed on onion skin paper at first and later photocopied on scrap paper. There was no internet back then, 
and answering machines didn't show up until the early 1970s. Her files contained postcards and air letters and telegrams and flyers and programs and menus and ticket stubs and notes from people who house sat her apartment and thank you notes for a multitude of gifts. She complained about the phone service and the mail. New York City in that period endured postal strikes and subway strikes and fires in the telephone switching stations. Her community was international and multi-generational. People all over the world, from high school students to notable artists and scholars, asked her for advice, offered manuscripts, sought jobs. She was patient with them. She hosted many of them in her apartment for cocktails and holiday dinners. I offer here a rough chronology of Selma Jean's life, which was tricky to build since the contents of the archives are mostly in alphabetical order. Sometimes the alphabetizing is based on the letterheads of official stationery rather than on people's names. I decided going in to read every piece of paper in every file. I also talked to people who knew her well. I knew her slightly. She was 25 years my senior, but actions she took in the 60s definitively shaped my career in the 70s and onward. We had similar instincts and similar communities. We were both passionate amateur dancers, students of literature, critical writers and teachers of writing. But in the 60s, she decided to concentrate her energies in dance history and scholarship, while I stuck with arts journalism. To begin at the beginning, Selma Jean was the only child of Frank A. Cohen and Minna Scud Cohen, who moved to Chicago from Muncie, Indiana, early in the 20th century. Frank and his four siblings were the children of Moses and Sarah Cohen, immigrants from Poland and apparently the first Eastern European Jews in Muncie. They got on well and prospered. Frank Cohen followed his father into the scrap metal business and he too prospered. Selma Jean attended the private University of Chicago Lab School graduating in 1937 when she was only 16, following the path of her father's youngest brother, Benjamin Victor Cohen. Her uncle Ben became a noted figure in the Roosevelt administration, an architect of the New Deal. He was her advisor and financial bulwark until his death in 1983. Both of them had broad cheeks and prominent chins, both were seriously nearsighted and very, very smart. Selma Jean told dance critic Mindy Aloff, when I got out of high school, each of the students was called into the dean's office and asked, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a dance historian. You want to be a what, was the reply? There is no such thing. But Selma Jean was already on her path. She'd been taking ballet with Chicago teacher Edna McRae, who realized the petite young woman had no talent and channeled her toward the studio's collection of dance books. Selma Jean borrowed and read them and began to build her own dance library. After high school, she went to Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri then a two-year college that attracted the daughters of wealthy Chicago families. She earned an associate in arts degree in 1939. On her transcript, her religious preference is noticed as Christian science, apparently a strategy whereby Jews in Chicago fit more easily into the community surrounding them. She did very well at Stevens, earning honors in English as well as European history, music appreciation, and American literature. Then she returned to her parents' apartment and the University of Chicago, where, she told Aloff, I really wanted to be involved in dance, but there weren't any classes about dance in the humanities. There were a few courses in dance technique, but not about dance history or ideas about dance. 
So she studied English literature, writing a dissertation on the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. She queried a number of authors on the process of writing historical fiction. In 1946, she moved to Los Angeles, probably because she had relatives there, and taught English at UCLA until 1948. She worked in the Hollywood studio of choreographer Eugene Loring, serving as a librarian and teacher and whetting her interest in dance notation. She began contributing to Dance Magazine around 1950, writing such articles as Ballet, the Universal Language and How It Grew. In Louis Horst's journal, Dance Observer, beginning in 1953, she wrote about Celia Franca, who founded a classical company in Canada and reviewed a concert at New York's High School of the Performing Arts. Later, she wrote in The Observer, we cannot develop researchers by wishing them into being, but by introducing young people already interested in dance to their full and existing heritage, we can inspire the incentive for research. This in itself can do much to raise the status of dance as an art. Her move to New York in 1953 was underwritten by a $500 gift from her uncle Ben, who was identified by Washington Post columnist Joe Alsop as the New Deal's finest legal draftsman. Although Selma Jean was immersed in a field that most adults, especially male adults, had trouble taking seriously, she had access to wise counsel on many fronts from Uncle Ben, a revered figure in progressive Washington. She went to work at New York's High School of Performing Arts, where her colleagues included choreographers Robert Joffrey and Lucas Hoving. Among her students were Judith Chasen Benaham, Bruce Marks, and Cora Kahn. In 1953, she took over teaching the dance history class from Lillian Moore, a ballet his teacher with a high school education who was one of the very first American dance historians. She and Moore pioneered the strategy of actually teaching historical dance forms to students who then performed them at concerts. Selma Jean taught at Performing Arts until 1956. Anne Hutchinson, then a prime mover at the Dance Notation Bureau, hired her to edit a book. She wrote for Dance Magazine about extraordinarily diverse subjects, including the 17th century British diarist Samuel Pepys and his adventures in dancing. From 1958, 1955 until 1958, Selma Jean assisted dance critic John Martin on the New York Times. Martin, who served there for 35 years from 1927 until 1962, was instrumental in advancing the reputations of major American modern dance figures. At the Times, Selma Jean wrote dance reviews, covered events for the society pages, and prepared advance obituaries. She was assigned to go to churches and summarize the sermons, but soon became one of the first female critics on the paper. She also wrote about dance for many encyclopedias. In 1959, she helped found Dance Perspectives, which she described years later as critical and historical monographs on dance, the only periodical concerned with scholarly studies in the field of dance. Inspired by predecessors like Lincoln Kirstein's Dance Index, her journal lasted until 1976, producing issues on American Ballet Theater's first 20 years, Frederick Ashton, Anthony Tudor, and Lester Horton, among many other figures. In the very first issue of Dance Perspectives, with Al Pichel as her co-founder and co-editor, she published Lincoln Kirstein's essay called What Ballet is About, dedicated to W.H. Auden. The magazine, its title page declared, was a place where, quote, writers of specialized knowledge and perceptive opinions can publish essays of considerable length, unquote. 
For $5 a year, subscribers got four issues, 60 to 80 pages each. The rate increased slowly over the years. In 1960, the New York Public Library published a slim volume reprinted from the library's bulletin titled Famed for Dance, Essays in the Theory and Practice of Theatrical Dancing in England, 1660 to 1740. Composed of essays written by Ifan Kirley Fletcher, Selma Jean herself, and Roger Lonsdale. In this book, Selma Jean shared her first significant dance research, turning up, according to critic and historian Alistair Macaulay, new information on the British ballerina Hester Santlau, muse to John Weaver, and much more. Truly original research in what was then terra incognita. Next, she spent a year working for the Performing Arts Library, assembling a bibliography of Italian ballet librettos. At the time, the dance collection was headed by Genevieve Oswald, whose specialty was music. Selma Jean and Lillian Moore became invaluable advisors on dance matters. The three of them became known as the Trinity, or the Three Graces, or the Three Musketeers. In 1961, she wrote to a friend, in addition to my job at the library, I've been working on a big bibliography for Dance Magazine. We're trying to get dancers interested in reading. Let's hope it works. A couple of years later, her colleague Doris Herring, a longtime fixture at Dance Magazine, warned Selma Jean, then heading to the summer session of the Connecticut College School of Dance in New London, to keep away from the submariners. Selma Jean's reply, no time for submariners. I'm taking dance class with Yuriko. I don't know if this means I'm terribly brave or terribly foolish. Her mother died in March of 1962, generating a cascade of sympathy notes. Her cousin Bernard Freund, a lawyer who remained in Muncie, Indiana, wrote to her, let Ben and me be family for you in the years to come. Her Aunt Bess, who lived in Los Angeles, wrote, I know you are very busy and interested in your work. You are used to living a life of your own, and that is a good thing for you now. You will not be lonely. Her archives chronicle the pre progress of various book projects, from concept to contract to finished volumes. Some proposals came to nothing. Mainstream publishers didn't think there was an audience for dance books. Some of her ideas bounced around as editors lost their jobs and resurfaced elsewhere. She found a home at Wesleyan University Press, where her first major publication, The Modern Dance, Seven Statements of Belief, became a surprise bestseller after it appeared in 1966. Originating in a series for Dance Magazine, it took years to come together as choreographers she originally hoped to include, like Merce Cunningham and Helen Tamiris, dropped out and new ones were added. The contributors each earned $100 for their essays and another $100 years later after the book had sold 500 copies. Selma Jean juggled projects, repurposing articles and issues of dance perspectives into books, serving on panels and juries, accepting lectureships and temporary teaching gigs. A piece she wrote in late 1960, Avant-Garde Choreography, for the journal Criticism at Detroit's Wayne State University, garnered a raft of responses, both grateful and critical, from artists across the country who were accustomed to being ignored. Deeply infatuated with the Royal Danish Ballet, Selma Jean worked for years to get August Bournonville's My Theater Life, translated by a young student, Patricia McAndrew, published in America. To McAndrew, she served as fairy godmother, cheerleader, agent, guidance counselor, catalyst, and host finally for a publication party 
when, after nearly a decade of work, the fat red volume appeared in 1979, published by Wesleyan. The fate of the arts in the United States began to change dramatically in the mid-1960s with the founding of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities. Selma Jean served on the first dance panel at the Arts Endowment, which allowed her to learn and teach at a national level, befriend artists she admired, and understand the works, the workings of government funding. In the 1960s, she worked with the National Regional Ballet Association, traveling the country to adjudicate festivals involving professional and semi-professional performers and students as young as nine, dispensing sage advice on technique, repertory, and other aspects of the work of developing companies. Meanwhile, she kept turning out stellar issues of dance perspectives. Selma Jean began teaching at the Connecticut College Summer School of Dance in 1963 an association which lasted nearly a decade and included the birth of the long-running Dance Critics Institute. When she arrived at, in New London in 1964, she wrote to Mary Clark, editor of London's Dancing Times, that the students are all very nice and interested and ignorant, so I feel needed. In 1965, she bought out her inactive colleagues at Dance Perspectives. That summer, she planned a trip to Europe on an ocean liner, but John Martin, who'd been hired to teach a course in dance criticism, got invited to go on tour with the New York City Ballet and jumped at the chance. Selma Jean replaced him at Connecticut, launching a program that lasted close to 50 years as the American Dance Festival, in association with the National Endowment for the Arts, continued to underwrite a gathering of critics to train with leaders in the field. Her files for those summers include directories of all the students and faculty at the summer sessions. In addition to teaching writing, she was asked to review the festival concerts for the New London Day, a situation she decided was unethical as she was an employee of the festival. Over the years, the New London Day sent its own writers to take her course. Lillian Moore became the director of the Joffrey Ballet's apprentice program in 1966 and wrote to Selma Jean, I do hope you will give the course on the writing of criticism, even though there are no jobs for your brilliant graduates. But Selma Jean had a prescient feeling that the blossoming dance boom, fueled by funding from the Arts Endowment, would change that situation. In 1966, she began teaching at the University of California at Riverside, a relationship that continued until 1989 and culminated in the establishment of a PhD degree in dance history, the first in the country. In November of 1967, Lillian Moore died of cancer, devastating Selma Jean, who called her, quote, the first friend I had in New York. I miss her terribly, and we needed her so. In the early 70s, Selma Jean turned an issue of Dance Perspectives, featuring an autobiography of Doris Humphrey, into a book augmenting the life story left hanging when the choreographer died of cancer in 1958. Selma Jean got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to support the project, which let her give up teaching and freelance writing for a stretch and take up an invitation to the McDowell Colony to finish her manuscript. Simon & Schuster turned it down, but Doris Humphrey, an artist first, also became a surprise bestseller for Wesleyan. Royalties from the project were shared, two-thirds to Selma Jean and a third to Charles Humphrey Woodford, the custodian of Humphrey's original material because he was her son. One consequence of Selma Jean's work at the annual Critics Conference at Connecticut was that when her books came out, she had a network of educated writers on newspapers across the country ready to review them. 
Her files are stuffed with those reviews. The University of Chicago gave her a Professional Achievement Award in 1974. That year, she implemented a project she'd been planning for years, a dance history seminar sponsored by the University of Chicago Extension. In her funding proposal, she wrote, because of the generally held but completely mistaken assumption that dance has no accessible history, no college or university in the United States has yet devised a curriculum for dance scholarship. The program was ho hosted on the Hyde Park campus by L.V. Moore, a former ADF student of Selma Jean's and the sole member of the University of Chicago's dance faculty, then based in its physical education department. Funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the seminar ran for three summers, focusing in the first year on the Romantic Ballet, in the second on Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, and in the final year, 1976, on theatrical dancing in America before 1900, coinciding with the country's bicentennial celebrations. The third year group included Nancy Reynolds, a dance book editor who played a major role in the production of the encyclopedia and later wrote the marvelous dance history book, No Fixed Points. Also present was Bill Bissell, an undergraduate at Fresno State who went on to become a program officer at Philadelphia's Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. Selma Jean not only taught these workshops in conjunction with visiting faculty, but she raised money and donated her own so students could have scholarships. In the second year, she helped organize an exhibit about the other arts involved in Diaghilev's ballet productions in a university gallery. The final report for the Humanities Endowment declared that the project placed quote, the history of dance against the backdrop of the culture in which it exists. Bissell said the seminar was social history. It was about ballet and modern dance being connected to the world. In 1974, Linda Weiner, who took one of the early critics workshops, wrote an article for the Chicago Tribune that began, it's one of life's ridiculous truths that you cannot major in dance history in this country. Copies of that story, which chronicles her visit to that first dance history workshop, appear in many folders in many boxes of Selma Jean's archive. Weiner, long the only female first string theater critic in New York, resigned from Newsday in 2017, commenting that criticism doesn't get clicks. The remarkable thing about Selma Jean's career as a dance scholar is that for only one year, 1976 to 1977, did she have a full-time academic job, appointed distinguished visiting professor by the five college dance department, which includes Smith, Amherst, Mount Holyoke, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Hampshire College. One of her Smith students, Leslie Farlow, was the first woman in her family to go to college. She said of Selma Jean, quote, she did a mini conference on virtuosity in the fall of 1977. I was an assistant to her on that, making phone calls. She was starting to think about the encyclopedia. I was interested in the questions she asked about dance history, about virtuosity. Farlow, recently retired after a long career at Trinity College in Hartford. I loved her book, Dance as a Theater Art, Farlow said, loved reading the works of the artists themselves because they were articulate as writers as well as artists. I've used that book so students get a sense of what the artists were thinking about, she told me. Selma Jean, she said, was kind of eccentric, words were squeezed out of her mouth, slow and deliberate. It encouraged me to be a bit more deliberate in what I was saying and thinking, a different rhythm. She was always very patient, interested in whoever she was speaking to. She considered us peers. She wanted me to feel that I had the tools and resources to participate in the field, but there was always a distance. 
She was the elder stateswoman. Selma Jean accepted short-term invitations to teach all over the continent, notably at York University in Toronto, which developed North America's first MA program in dance history. She offered special courses and seminars there. York asked her to apply to be chairman of its department, an offer she turned down. Instead of a full-time job, she juggled multiple part-time and short-term assignments and projects of her own devising. In a Selma celebration of Selma Dreen's 75th birthday in 1999, Judith Chazen Benaham, who studied with her at Performing Arts and went on to become the chairman of the dance department at the University of New Mexico, quoted her as saying, you must realize that this is guerrilla warfare. You have to infiltrate other departments and colleges. Get them to believe you are as good as they are. You must know more and be better. This language echoes the clarion call of second wave feminists and African Americans in the 60s and 70s. Dance had to do battle with the widespread belief that women in academe were not in it for the long term, that they were out to catch husbands. Selma Jean was not out to catch a husband. She never married, and her files reveal no evidence of affairs of the heart. Early on, she apparently carried a torch for Eugene Loring, but he, like so many men in the dance world, was gay. Selma Jean was interested in cooking, clothes, decor, even flower arranging, and had regular appointments to style her red hair, but mostly she worked. I was tempted to characterize her as a kind of dance nun, but in fact, she was the mother superior. She counseled many students who wanted to study dance history, but found no place to do it. She advised programs so students could have somewhere to work. She joined many academic organizations like the American Society of Aesthetics and the American Society for Theater Research and wound up on their boards. She contributed annual bibliographies to several of them. She gave talks at their annual meeting at one in Detroit in 1962, she observed that we've lost the habit of thinking about dance. At Connecticut, she taught another young Selma, a young woman from Illinois who came to the American Dance Festival in 1963 and became Selma Jean's, quote, most cherished protege. Selma Landon Odom, took an MA in theater history at Tufts because graduate work in dance history was still a distant dream. And she wound up at York University where she taught for decades before retiring in 2009. She was sure she got the job because Selma Jean recommended her. Their correspondence lasted decades and is confusing to follow one Selma writing to another, but heartwarming in the enthusiasm each had for the other and for their work. Connecticut College's School of Dance was where Selma Jean started building her community. Her network of critics and scholars, she caught them young. To enter her writing class, her notes declare, serious interest and a respectable command of language are the only prerequisites. Critic Marcia Siegel, who later taught these writing workshops on both coasts, witnessed a panel of dance writers at ADF and wrote to festival director Charlie Reinhardt in 1969, we all know how badly dance needs intelligent coverage outside of New York. It seems to me eminently practical to make contact with people already employed as working reporters and critics and give them a basic familiarity with the field. If we can send half a dozen people per year back to their newspapers, with the enthusiasm and sense of community that are so characteristic of dance, I think we'll have won a major point. I benefited directly from this strategy. In, 1990, in 1977, the, da the Canada Council sent me from Vancouver to New London to study with Siegel, Deborah Jowett, and a succession of guest critics. Like Lincoln Kirstein, Selma Jean was a person of independent means, which enabled her to travel, live well, 
and pick and choose her professional assignments, avoiding the drudgery of full-time academic work. She took seriously grading papers and writing recommendations. Remember how you waived your right to see the letters your teachers and mentors sent to universities? Well, some of those letters are in her files. She pulled no punches, writing even about her young favorites. She'd begin with compliments, briskly list her reservations, and return to highly recommend. Her real talents were as writer, editor, and lobbyist for the discipline that won her heart. Dance Perspectives astounded its international readership, who thought it beautiful and intelligent. Her goal, she said, was to attract an audience to reading about dance. We try, she told one writer, to take a very small subject and explore it in depth. She started the magazine she wanted to work for and supported it for years with her own funds. Each issue consisted of one 15,000 to 20,000 word piece, profusely illustrated and designed mostly by Carl Lebo. He also worked for Playbill and donated his services to Dance Perspective for years before he resigned in a huff, telling her in 1969 that, quote, we have jointly created the best dance magazine in the world. It's not viable in the ordinary commercial sense. At that point, Selma Jean was facing bills of more than $900 in unpaid, $9,000, excuse me, in unpaid bills, many from him. The writers received about $150 per issue for their labors in 1971. Her readers were largely members of the dance audience, about 3,000 subscribers. She wrote to a colleague, getting the general public interested in historical material is really a struggle. I have no intention of giving it up. After he retired from the New York Times, John Martin moved to California, but kept in touch, serving as a member of the editorial board of Dance Perspectives. He wrote to Selma Jean in 1968, to have upped the subscription list by 50% in three years is damn good for a highbrow sheet about a chichi subject such as high kicking and all that jazz. Word of her unique publication spread far and wide. Scholars, dancers, and members of the public sent in ideas or entire manuscripts. A whole folder in the archives consists of very polite rejection letters Selma Jean had clear standards and strategies, queries that were totally inappropriate and job applications from people who wanted to work on it were treated with respect. She said she wanted articles that were original and provocative as well as informative. In 1974, she turned down a proposal for an article about Twyla Tharp because she said, I don't feel she has reached the stage where we can obtain a perspective on her work. And this perspective is the guideline that we use to determine which contemporary figures merit an issue. She rejected proposals about black choreographers for similar reasons. By the mid 1970s, the magazine was paying writers $250 an issue. Her favorite among them, she said, was the one focusing on Eric Brune I'd ask one question and he'd talk for an hour, she said. The Brun issue sold thousands of extra copies all over the world. In an oral history at the library, Selma Jean discusses Doris Humphrey with William Bales, who danced in Humphrey's company. He was also my teacher at Bennington. Referring to the quarterly appearance of dance perspectives, she observes that she has four children a year and I feel that way about every one of them. Her speaking voice was low, languid, almost honeyed, a Midwesterner, not a harried New Yorker, though she learned our ways in her 55 years living in the city, jumping from crisis to crisis. In the late 60s, she began compiling a textbook for dance history studies, Dance as a Theater Art that included primary sources from as far back as 1581 and as current 
as Merce Cunningham, George Balanchine, Alwyn Nikolai, and Meredith Monk. When the book finally appeared in 1974, after inordinate delays and a shift to publisher Dodd Mead and Company, it revolutionized the teaching of dance history in America. Reviews were uniformly enthusiastic. Due to her desire to keep the volume cheap enough for dance students to afford, she had to admit sections that she cherished, like an essay from antique choreographer Jamie Cunningham, a startling favorite. She called him very bright, very avant-garde, and very much in touch with the kids today. Dance is an art of motion. She realized that film and later video would be essential to her teaching. One of her early writing workshops included a young professor of political science, John Mueller, who offered at the University of Rochester a dance history course using a lot of film. She made an exception in letting him in since he was not a working journalist but he went on to issue guides to dance on film and a book about the films of Fred Astaire. By then, she had an office assistant two days a week and a maid two afternoons a week. In 1973, she turned the dance critics training course over to Deborah Jowett at the Village Voice. The research process in the Selma Jean Cohen papers is like eating fruitcake. Amid stretches of ordinariness, wonderful nuggets pop up, like the jumpy typeface in letters written by Paul Taylor on his manual typewriter, like thank you notes from Merce Cunningham, to whom Selma Jean apparently made regular donations, like comments from her young colleagues who encountered her at performances and sent her photos of their new babies, like a letter from Tennessee Williams and a letter from me. She became a sort of Miss Manners or Ann Landers of the dance world, available to hand out advice on an enormous range of subjects. She was a strategist, hooking people up with jobs, mentors, dissertation subjects, and often a place in Manhattan to lay their weary heads. Susan Au, one of her earliest students who later collaborated with her on a book, called her the Johnny Appleseed of dance history. In 1974, she was instrumental in founding the Dance Critics Association. Bill Littler, a Canadian journalist who took her Connecticut class, became the founding chair of the organization. One of the pleasures of her archive is her extensive correspondence with Jose Rollin de la Torre Bueno, an editor and executive at Wesleyan University Press who was the first publisher to develop a dance studies titles list. Selma Jean's task was not only to conceive and assemble or write her books, but to market them. And she was always thinking about how to do that. In 1982, she sent a publisher a list of 181 colleges offering courses in dance history theory and appreciation. The total number of colleges with dance majors was 241, and with minors and non-degree courses in dance, 320. That year, she and several colleagues established at the University of California an intercampus MA in dance history. She taught at UC Irvine, and she wrote a letter to the producer of NPR's Sunday show that demonstrates her rapier instincts. I'm quite interested, she said, in serving on your advisory committee. After hearing all these conversations with stars, it would be good to listen to some real ideas about the arts. She tried unsuccessfully to get Wesleyan to take over as publisher of Dance Perspectives, noting that the trouble is my utter bewilderment with the business aspects of the magazine. I don't understand anything connected with numbers or money or the law, and I don't want to have to try, but I must, and I will. Bill Bueno told her she was the power behind the throne at Wesleyan's dance book list. 
Selma Jean's correspondence with him spans close to 20 years, from the time of the modern dance to his death from lung cancer in 1980. Recipients of the Delatore Bueno Prize over the years have included Deborah Jowett, Thomas de France, John Mueller, and practically every other smart dance book author in the Western world. Selma Jean, during her lifetime, held cocktail receptions in her living room honoring the winners, welcoming as many as 50 guests. The award is now administered by the Dance Studies Association, formed after the merger of the Society of Dance History Scholars and CORD in 2017. The Society of Dance History Scholars realized in the 1990s Selma Jean's long-held dream of having dance represented in the American Council of Learned Societies. De France wrote about the impact of his 2005 award, quote, it acted as a validation for me. It affirmed that the choices I made to pursue African-American performance as the heart and hearth of my academic work could be visible and celebrated. It told me and the institutions I worked for that it mattered to write about dance in a caring and careful manner. At midlife, Selma Jean resolved to learn Russian, attended the language school at Middlebury College, and developed epistolary relationships with dance writers in the Soviet Union. She sent them books and issues of dance perspectives that they could not get any other way, and they reciprocated. In the late 80s and early 90s, as the USSR was collapsing, she proposed that Dance Magazine publish articles from the Sovietsky Ballet, and vice versa. During her year at the five colleges, she was arranging to let dance perspectives go, a tragedy for dance scholarship, but quickly replaced by Dance Chronicle, a journal initially edited by her friends, Jack Anderson and George Doris. In 1977, she started seriously studying Russian and developing her life's major undertaking, the Na International Encyclopedia of Dance. She won planning grants from both endowments and assembled a team of editors, including Doris, Nancy Goldner, Beata Gordon, Nancy Reynolds, David Vaughan, and Suzanne Youngerman. In 1980, she received a $5,000 fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation to write a book on dance aesthetics, a project that became next week Swan Lake. Initially rejected by Houghton Mifflin, it was published by Wesleyan in 1960, 1982. On her application for the grant, she said she'd studied dance for 20 years, from 1933 to 1953, with McRae, Martha Graham, Hanya Holm, and Jose Limon. When she gave up dance classes, she began swimming, but she bemoaned the loss of her technical studies, especially when arthritis kicked in. I wish I had kept them up, she wrote to a dancing friend in 1981. All I can do is swim, and the health clubs don't pay sh play Chopin and Schubert at the pool, and I wish I were back at the bar. In 1981, she received a Dance Magazine Award the first scholar to be so honored. In 1982, dancer Billy Mahoney recorded a video interview in which Selma Jean identified herself as a terpsichologist. Later in the video, she discusses her dissatisfaction with being a dance critic, declaring that she hated the pressure of overnight deadlines and wanted to take weeks and months until she got it right. In the 1980s, overwhelmed with the task of steering the International Encyclopedia of Dance, she began to keep cats. In 1993, she provided for the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism a short piece on the aesthetics of the cat. At her 75th birthday celebration, she bemoaned the absence of her feline companion, Giselle. I believe that that is Giselle. She traveled to the USSR and in 1989 visited Tashkent, 
on a mission to promote international cultural exchange for a group called People to People International. The following year, she led a dance tour to Leningrad, Moscow, and Tashkent. Dance Magazine published a piece on her trip to Uzbekistan. She wrote to a colleague, I suspect the problems of intercultural meanings are not so different from those of intercentury meanings, which have interested me for some time. See next week, Swan Lake. Celia Ipiotis started a cable program, Eye on Dance, in 1941, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary this month. Selma Jean, she observed, was one of Eye on Dance's godmothers. In 1985, she appeared on a program with Lutz Forster in the Limon Company at the time and Letitia Ide. The program was Terpsichorean Tales, Telling Stories Through Dance. We talked, said Ipiotis, about Othello. She was my ballet whisperer, my early roots of modern dance whisperer. I'd take notes and then I'd go to the library and look people up. She was a fervent learner, a very dear person. She worked eye on dance into the fabric of the dance scholars community because she saw it as a platform for them to be heard. It happened to be on TV, but it was serious. She had me introduce the winner of the Delatore Bueno Prize so people would see me as a dance historian. Critic Robert Johnson, a longtime staffer at Dance Magazine, once observed the prim, proper, old-fashioned, elegant lady, as he put it, in the front row at an Elizabeth Streb performance, wearing, quote, a helmet and pearls, impeccably dressed as always. There was broken glass everywhere. She brushed the glass off her skirt. I remember this gesture more than anything else. Said Marcia Siegel, who knew her for decades, quote, she was maddening, very proper. I didn't know anyone else at that time who would have worn white gloves to things. The production of the International Encyclopedia of Dance was a decades long saga, initially taken on by Scribner's. It migrated to the University of California Press which projected its publication for the fall of 1991. Consequences of this move were horrific. Nancy Reynolds of the editorial collective declared that fall, I believe we are all paying the price for the press having engaged both copy editors and a photo editor with no subject background. Reynolds told me, it took 24 years of my life, but it did get published. Selma Jean was promoting Promoted to editor emerita part way, things were going south in her mind. She had an amazing mind, but she began to lose things. Reading the massive files engendered by the Encyclopedia Project raises one's blood pressure even 22 years after it came out. Furious with inadequate performance by a UC Press staffer, Selma Jean wrote, if Alexandra is paid for doing a poor job, shouldn't the editors be paid for correcting her mistakes? That memo is signed, sincerely, Giselle's mommy. As time went by, people, both subjects and authors of encyclopedia articles, kept dying. Many revisions became necessary. UC Press re withdrew from the project in the fall of 1993. Finally, in April of 1994, Selma Jean signed an eight-page agreement with Oxford University Press, then under the direction of Claude Conyers. This agreement commissioned her to supervise editorial review and assist in the final assembly of materials for $5,000 plus expenses. Her editorial board in Oxford by then had figured out that she couldn't do it alone and assembled a crew including Elizabeth Aldridge and Dance Perspective Board President Curtis Carter to help bring the project home. The six oversized volumes comprising 4,000 pages costing $1,400 and greeted by a mixed review in the New York Times, were, were greeted by a mixed review in the New York Times. Here we go. The name Cohen 
is printed in gold on the spine of each volume above the title. Now you can buy the encyclopedia online, new in paperback, for about $188 and used in hardcover for less than that or in an electronic format, probably much easier to use and store. In 1994, the Society of Dance History Scholars established the Selma Jean Cohen Young Scholars Program to support presentations at its annual conference. Six years later, the Selma Jean Cohen Fund for International Scholarship in Dance was founded, both prizes underwritten by their namesake. The fund pays for writers of dance history papers to lecture at the annual gathering of Fulbright scholars providing an honorarium, round-trip travel, and per diem, and keeping excellent dance scholarship in front of a broad swath of academic stars. Recent recipients of this prize have included Millicent Hodson, Barbara Browning, and Jonathan Hollander, who was entranced by Selma Jean when she invited him for tea. She was so proper, Jonathan told me, it was like stepping back in history. How powerful were her passion and mission to take dance and put it where it belonged, in the understanding of the world and how people lived. Her strategic mind understood that the legacy could be, her legacy could be endowing people to talk about dance. Awards are also given in Selma Jean's name at the American Society of Theater Research supporting attendance at their conference and a presentation that explores the intersection of theater and dance, and at the American Society for Aesthetics, which offers a biennial prize in dance aesthetics, dance theory, or the history of dance. After Selma Jean's death in 2005, author Susan Manning mentored by Selma Jean when she was still in high school and a former president of the Society of Dance History Scholars, spoke at a memorial service at Columbia. Manning said of Selma Jean's presence at her dissertation defense in 1987, after the customary rising of all committee members, several approached to embrace me. After they had all filed out, Selma Jean turned to me and in a tone of amused disbelief exclaimed, no one ever kissed at a defense in my day. Then we walked to lunch and she voiced her true assessment of my thesis. There are 10 books buried within that dissertation. Now you have to figure out which one you want to write. Later, Manning said of Selma Jean, her influence far exceeded her official roles. Her vision of dance studies as a passionately rigorous multidisciplinary and international inquiry continues to inform our mission. In 1995, Selma Jean's 75th birthday was celebrated by her friends and colleagues in the Performing Arts Library. Gigi Oswald called her a woman of tremendous graciousness and poise, a one-woman task force. Colleagues in the theater community pointed out that she brought dance history to the study of popular entertainment, wrote about dance in Shakespeare, and was more responsible for the spread of dance history and dance aesthetics than anyone else in the world. Selma Jean began her professional life in New York at the dawn of the dance boom, when artists like Cunningham, Humphrey, Balanchine, and Tharp were in their prime. She built a core of scholars who took dance seriously as an academic discipline. We who follow her are grateful. In 2021, we find ourselves looking at a reduced dance landscape with many factors combining to keep viewers out of theaters. Hardly any outlets remain to publish criticism. One NYU dance teacher told me that her dance students don't know who Martha Graham is. The New York real estate situation, which permitted so much creative ferment from the 1950s through the 1980s, is now impossible for most artists, and many are returning to the universities that sheltered them initially. Others are just giving up. 
thank you for joining me for this talk. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by two recipients of the Selma Jean Cohn Lecture Award, Laurel Gray and Jonathan Hollander. Selma Jean set up an endowment to support dance scholarship at the plenary of the Fulbright Association's annual conference, and both of these artists have been recipients of this award. And now, I think we welcome Jonathan Hollander and Laurel Gray, and we'll field some of your questions, and then each of them will have a chance to talk about Selma Jean. There are two questions. Um, well, this is Wendy Perrin. This is not a question, but it's a comment. I had no idea how many things she had done. I still have my original copy of Modern Dance, Seven Statements of Belief. From now on, every time I pass my shelf of Wesleyan University Press books, I will think of her. Wendy Perrin has published several U Wesleyan University Press books since that time. And then her, she also asks, is there any chance that dance perspectives would be digitized? What I want to see is uh, the whole thing being reissued. I don't know. Somebody has to come up with the funds and the personnel, but it's absolutely a spectacular publication. I spent a good week going over all 66 copies of it in the Performing Arts Library. It's available there both to read in the research library and to check out. If you're in New York City, you can check it out. It's a magnificent thing, but I can't answer that question. Uh, Laurel, uh, you won this award in 2009. Do you want to speak to it? Yes, you know, there's a saying that you don't really know someone until you travel with them. I had gotten an invitation from the Union of Theatrical Workers of Uzbekistan, where I had built a, a relationship over many years um, to bring a delegation of theater workers. So I brought representatives from all of Seattle's equity theaters and then dancers who were specializing in dances of Eastern cultures. I saw in Dance Magazine a letter from Selma Jean saying that she had just gotten the entry about Uzbekistan for her, her encyclopedia and she wanted to go to Uzbekistan. I was so excited to read that. And I thought, well, I have an invitation. So I contacted her. She didn't know who I was. She willingly joined our delegation. She was the senior member of the delegation and certainly the most credentialed person and the easiest person to have on this delegation of all these different dance and theater egos. She would say to me when I said, okay, we have, we've been booked in several places, which do you want to go to? She would say, I just do as I'm told. She spoke her Russian the same way she spoke English, slowly, deliberately and precisely, and uh, joined me on Uzbek television to give interviews uh, about the International Encyclopedia of Dance, inspired an Uzbek choreographer, uh, Kadir Muminov, who to this day remembers her talking about Uzbek men's dance and being thrilled that she finally got to see it. And personally, she changed my approach to dance because my big challenge has been to present Central Asian dance to American audiences who couldn't find Uzbekistan on a map, right? At least not until recently, you know, how can I open this world to them and help them understand the different aesthetics? And she told me, you must tell your audience what you want them to know. So provide extensive program notes. I've done that ever since much to the annoyance of people who have to print out my programs. But I think it's great advice for everybody. Let the audience know in your program notes what you want them to know. So she's still remembered in Uzbekistan and certainly had a profound influence on my life. Thank you. Um, and the, the situation with program notes is going south really fast. Increasingly, theaters are not providing program notes. They don't want to pay to print things on paper. Mm -hmm. um, now, with the uh, pandemic, they don't want 
pieces of paper floating around in their mm -hmm. theaters. And so everything is either disappearing or moving online, which I think is the wrong idea. I think audiences want the program mm -hmm. notes in the theater in their hands. And I, I electioneer for that. Jonathan, do you want to jump in here? I would love to. Um, first of all, Elizabeth, thank you so much for that incredible to the to the one hour mark presentation. It was it, it was, was sprint. Let me just it was see. it was sensational. Really, um, bringing back this this wonderful woman. Uh, a couple of things. One is I did a Fulbright lecturing grant in India in 1992, and when I came back, I was summoned to the home of none other than Selma Jean Cohen to reflect on the passages in the encyclopedia on Indian dance. I was supposed to be advising her as to whether or not she had done a good job of covering it. Well, I think it's extraordinary, even looking at the encyclopedia today and realizing how deeply she didn't write about the pieces, but she brought people like Dr. Sunil Kotari and had him write about not just Indian dance in general, but for example, Manipuri dance and not just Manipuri dance, but the Javeri sisters who were the foremost Manipuri dancers in the world, overlooked by Beata Gordon, I might say, because they were not originally born in Manipur. Nevertheless, having studied with Guru Bipin Singh, who came and lived with their home from the time that their eight-year-old oldest daughter decided that she was meant to be a Manipuri dancer, the whole, then all four sisters becoming Manipuri dancers. So this was the kind of thing that Selma Jean Cohen was interested in. And I think it's radical because in 1993, when I was naive enough to think that I could organize American tours by two Indian dance companies to share with the American audience the beauties of uh, Indian dance that I had experienced firsthand and discovered that newspapers did not want to cover because, quote from the Houston Chronicle, we don't cover ethnic dance mm -hmm. and we don't cover events that only happen in one night because they're irrelevant to our audience to read about afterwards. Look at this, look at what Selma Jean was doing at a time when the sort of understood behavior of journalists and, and scholars and people involved in media were that this was an irrelevancy. I think it's incredible. And then one other thing to say, how strategic she was to endow the Fulbright with money so that every year when scholars come who are from the worlds of science and engineering and mathematics and whatever to gather around this wonderful Fulbright nexus, that there's a speech on dance. How strategic, how amazing. So, I think her, I, I think she was strategic. I think she was so effective. And again, speaking for Indian dance, the fact that, you know, that now Indian dance is very much taken seriously. Alastair Macaulay, of course, you know, made a big dent in that. Elizabeth, you've covered it. Robert Johnson did an incredible job with it. Um, you know, the, the, the landscape has changed, but she was the one who set that in motion, in my opinion. I have two more comments here from the chat. Um, one is from Julie Van Camp, who is, I think, the treasurer uh, of the American Society of Aesthetics, and she notes that the ASA prize has been awarded annually since 2016, alternating books and articles. The next deadline is May 1st, 2021, and if you look in the chat, you will find the... Uh, information on how to access the Cohen Prize at the American Society for Aesthetics. I also have a comment here from Alice Blumenfeld, who was another recipient of the Selma Jean Cohen Award much more recently. And this is something that both of you could chime in on. Um, where do you see the future of dance going post COVID? I know that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Do either of you want to jump well, in? Well, I would just go ahead, Laurel. Yeah, I would thank you. And and also I want to compliment you, Elizabeth. For, this is, you know, Zoom lectures are often sometimes difficult, and this was so engaging. I'm so thrilled that it's going to be made available to people 
afterwards on the Fulbright YouTube channel. So people who missed it can have a chance to enjoy it. Um, with my dance company, we've been rehearsing twice a week on Zoom. Um, and we're gonna be getting out of our little pod very soon. We've got some bookings already um, in this year, but I can't tell. I, I think the international contacts that we've made, it, that will last. Um, being able to lecture uh, at conferences, international conferences with my colleagues in Uzbekistan, um, in spite of having to get up at 4 a.m. to do it. Without these having to buy an airline ticket. <laughs> Without having to buy an airline ticket or worried about, you know, yeah. But, yeah. but I think those international con uh, contacts will be strengthened. But, you know, I think we, you just have to keep going. We have been uh, creating a lot of um, online uh, content and concerts online. They've had to be solo concerts. It's great for the dancers to develop a solo, but, uh, you know, like I always tell my dancers, you have to be flexible in mind as well as body. So just take it where it's a new age coming up. Just have to keep going. I, I have one more question here, uh, and I have to confess that this question is from my nephew who lives <laughs> in Chicago. Uh, it's a great question. It's partly a question and partly a comment. Evan Richter asks, how do you think Selma Jean Cohen would react to how dance has made its way into popular culture over the past 10 years? With mm -hmm. shows like Dancing with the Stars and the rise of popularity with TikTok dances, it seems that its accessibility is increasing, but its meaning and history may be moving mm -hmm. in the other direction. This is very wise, Evan. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's part of the whole, um, what Laurel was referring to and what we all know is the online dance. And, you know, Battery Dance went online on March 27th of last year. And since then we put up 1200 different types of programs, interviews, performances, and classes. And we've reached people in 202 countries, uh, 1.5 million views. Well, that says something. Battery Dance was uh, you know, known in Lower Manhattan and known in the 70 countries around the world where we've done programs with US embassies. But the, the exchange, because we've not only been promoting ourselves, but we've, been, uh, we've had interviews with dancers from many, many different countries. And so the knowledge base for general audiences is, is expanding tremendously. And you know that just goes along with the fact of the whole media going online more and more and having people op opining about dance performances, writing about dance performances on things like Dance Enthusiast, which is not a formal vehicle, it's not a print vehicle, but it has many voices of, and many views of people. And I, I think that's all a very positive thing. I have spent the last two weekends, Friday night, one weekend, Saturday night, this past weekend, online at concerts in San Francisco, uh, assembled by a, at a place called Dance Mission, which is to say assembled in the ether, most of it dance on film by black choreographers from all over the country uh, with a, an MC, an astonishing MC named Rodessa Jones, who is Bill T. Jones's big sister and she's a remarkable figure in her own right. I cannot stress how wonderful these concerts were. And before the pandemic, in a million years, I would not have gotten to see them. They, they were combining uh, dancers from Brooklyn, dancers from San Francisco, dancers from Los Angeles, dancers from New Orleans. It, astonishing work, dance mission, look it up. Um, and let me say one more thing about all of this, that the, the agent which makes it possible for all of this to happen is no longer, you know, the New York Times is no longer the arbiter. The arbiter is Facebook, the place where all the young folk are looking for their dance information is Facebook. They are not subscribing to newspapers, but they're pretty much all keeping tabs on Facebook. And Instagram. And, and well, yeah, I'm I'm of a generation that hasn't arrived at Instagram. <laughs> I'm not a I don't tweet and I don't do Instagram. I stopped short at Facebook, but I have been taken over by Facebook. I have to say, I still read the Times. We've been able to offer our annual Central Asian Dance Camp 
um, virtually. This past year, we worked with the embassy of Uzbekistan where we had held it in person, but I said, you know, we've got to make this experience the same way as, a, as the live camp was, but we added the dimension. So we had teachers in Uzbekistan teaching. Again, we had to account for the time difference. So people were able to study Uzbek dance with leading choreographers in their home. And I even arranged a tour of the Tamar Hanum Museum. Tamar Hanum was the first woman in Uzbekistan to dance in public in the 1920s. And um, she risked her life to do it. Uh, so there, they, we can add these exciting dimensions. People who might never be able to go to Uzbekistan and go to these museums might never eat, meet an Uzbek person in their life, but they were able to experience dance and culture through this new opportunity. So there's a whole other dimension entering to dance. And I think we just have to be open to the change. Yep. Uh, you know, Zoom is essentially free <laughs> to people that are on it. And you don't have to rent the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center, um, which democratizes access to audiences all over the world. It, it, if, if anything is going to dismantle white supremacy in dance, I think it might just turn out to be this pandemic. Mm. Anybody else? That's all the questions I've got. Any more comments? Thank you to the Fulbright for giving us this platform, one more platform for dance. Yes. And thank you for your research. Um, I uh, obviously encountered Selma Jean Cohen later in her life. And to know about her early history is, it, it's exhausting. It's, I think like, well, one oh, of the I haven't done enough. <laughs> one of the reasons this paper is so long is that there was, I just could not leave this stuff out. I, I could mm -hmm. not leave out her accomplishments, but I also could not leave out her personality. Mm -hmm. You know, when I presented this paper at the Performing Arts Library a year ago, January, we had video. Uh, all that video is embargoed in the library. I was not, you know, because the staff is not working in the library, I couldn't get the materials out. But I encourage anybody who ever gets to New York to get in there and, and look in these boxes. There are, I think it's 24 running feet of boxes of papers and videos and stuff. The, the Performing Arts Library at Lincoln Center is a non paral resource. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and thank you especially to Elizabeth Zimmer for sharing her research with us. Um, a virtual clapping high five for all of you. And um, want to thank the members and donors who make all of our programming at Fulbright Association possible. And uh, here are some details for the upcoming other Fulbright forums. If you'd like to uh, join us, they're all open to the public. Um, April 22nd, global sea level rise and our changing coastal future. And then May 11th, fighting human trafficking. And all of that can be found at fulbright.org slash calendar. Thank you once again to Elizabeth Zimmer for sharing her time and expertise and knowledge about Selma Jean Cohen and bringing this history to uh, a modern time in a pandemic with Zoom. So thank you so much. Have a great day.